budget represents a contribution to the successful implementation of this great national enterprise. On the 24th of July 1991, the then Finance Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh presented a budget that would be game-changing for India. It heralded the opening up of the Indian economy and a transformation that we are seeing even today. As the economy opened up, so did opportunity and enterprise, giving rise to a new wave of companies and entrepreneurs who led from the front. Shapers of Indian enterprise puts the spotlight on a clutch of these companies that embraced the new way and transformed themselves and the sectors that they operated in. What changed and how did these companies and their leaders shape enterprise and help in the making of modern India? Hello and welcome to the start of a fresh new series uh, in Live History India under the banner of the making of modern India. When you talk about the making of modern India, you generally talk about politics, about uh, society, the transformation of India, but you rarely talk about one of the most important ingredients in this transformation, the role of entrepreneurs and enterprise. The fact that starting 1991, especially, there was a sea change in the way the companies grew, opportunities uh, came up, and the transformation it led across sectors. It's a good time to talk about this also because 2021 marked 30 years of liberalization, the opening up of India's economy. Of course, uh, thanks to a crisis, but look where it has got us since then. Today, we have a very interesting panel for you uh, and we are going to be talking about this new series uh, that I'm very happy to say is uh, uh, being led by uh, Mr. R. Gopalakrishnan, who has been, of course, uh, an executive director at Tata Sons, many of the Tata companies. He was the vice chairman of Hindustan uh, Lever in India. And he's written numerous books on management, on leadership, and really the journey of many of these companies that we are going to be talking about. He's leading the series with us and brings a fabulous uh, amount of insights and perspectives on what we are going to be talking about. We also have uh, Dr. Tulsi Jayakumar. She's the chair of the family-owned businesses uh, uh, department at the SP Jain Institute of Management and Research. Uh, she's an economist. And it's a very important perspective because what really happened over the last uh, uh, 75 years was the transformation of how business has been done, how it's been perceived, and this new generation of people who have led from the front. Also, uh, uh, I have with me uh, Mr. Anil Singhvi, uh, one of the most respected voices as far as India's uh, uh, financial markets are concerned. He is the founder of ICANN Investments, uh, an advisory service uh, which really looks at uh, companies, helps institutional investors make uh, right choices, and holds the flag up for corporate governance and ethics, something that uh, is increasingly becoming the focus, and importantly so, in the context of India. Thank you all for joining us. And of course, Mr. Singh has also led the transformation of many companies. Uh, he's been a veteran from the cement industry. And that's an interesting perspective because that's where the building of India happened, right, in the last uh, couple of decades. So uh, thank you uh, all for joining us. You know, uh, Before we talk about the watershed that 1991 was and how it kind of transformed the economy and the way business was being done, Mr. Gopal Krishna, I'm going to start with you to quickly put in context the shapers of uh, Indian enterprise as a series because we worked on it together. And I think uh, in the essence, it was also about the kind of people who led these companies, the kind of business that these companies did. Uh, so uh, do take us through your own overview of how you see the series. Thank you, Mini. That's a, it's a great pleasure for me to participate in this. Well, I'm a passionate believer in the importance of enterprise. I consider enterprise to be the bullseye position of three concentric circles in any society. E stands for enterprise, which is the innermost circle. The second circle stands for education, which culture and primary, secondary education and so on. And the third stands for excitement because society can then enjoy the fruits of enterprise which are fed into education and cultural benefits, and then society can prosper. So I'm very happy that 
uh, LHI has found the opportunity to focus on uh, enterprise. Having spent 50 years, uh, I think it's a very important uh, part of society, though society doesn't know much about it. And it's our task in this series to try to make it a little less uh, mumbo jumbo in finance and make it more human. Uh, I would like to just mention briefly that it was a casual conversation I had with people like Dr. Tulsi Jaikumar, who's also on this panel at the faculty room of the SPJ and Institute, when we said, what is uh, an institution? And that led to a certain kind of discussion and a set of activities, all of which are not germane to the question that has been posed to me by Mini. We said, let us focus on what is a sustainable and well-performing enterprise. I use the word sustainable to mean it can live long. I use the word sustainable to mean that it is sensitive to its environment. It is sensitive to ecosystems and well-performing. So we started to look around for companies and enterprises which came up in or around liberalization. And we found it very, very difficult because the criteria that we set and it is a judgment on our part, we were not giving away prizes, where it must have an impeccable and consistent public reputation. Not infallible, but it must be a consistent and high quality public reputation. Second, that the impact they have is not just for shareholders, but for stakeholders. The third is that they must have a consistent leadership, uh, not sort of patchy. The fourth, that they must represent a new ambition for enterprise in India, not just going into the same old things that were there 150 years ago, and that their story should reflect the evolution of India's economy. Uh, having put these criteria, we trawled the listed companies on the stock exchange. Obviously, we had to go for listed companies. And uh, we wrote to some of them, and some of them responded, and we started researching them. So that's the background. And in the series that LHI is now launching, we will have, by the time we finish, eight or nine or ten companies, uh, several of which uh, we have already done in the SPJMR research and written books about. But LHI gave the opportunity to expand the net a little bit and bring in other companies so that we have sectoral representation of multiple industries, not just a few. So that's the background. And I'm very excited that we, uh, Mini has thought of this idea of putting this into the a general lay public domain rather than a chamber of commerce where typically this would go. Thank you. <laughs> you uh, thanks for that, Mr. Gopalakrishnan, because you know, having spent a lot of time in the chambers of commerce and as a journalist of business and finance in India, I must say one of the things that always frustrated me was why was conversations around this and enterprise and entrepreneurship limited to a very small community? Why doesn't every Indian know about the stories? of India's great entrepreneurs. We know about Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and all of them, but we don't know enough about our own. But thankfully that's changing because uh, we are getting uh, new unicorns and billionaires by the day uh, with what's happening in the startup economy. But just a quick heads up on the kind of companies that we're talking about. We're talking about institution builders, companies like HDFC, uh, the, uh, the home finance company that went on to also start a bank. It has multiple uh, arms and legs, but it is a phenomenal company because it's really been a pioneer and a successful pioneer. Personally, what has uh, uh, you know, also excited me about many of the companies that we're talking about is that not only are they great companies, they are pioneers, they've stayed ahead of the game and they've continued to stay ahead of the game, which is really a very interesting uh, phenomenon. You look at a Maruti, for instance, again, a company that started off as one of the first movers, but look at the market share it has even after so many years, and it shows that it is doing something right. We also have some great entrepreneurs who we cannot ignore, people like Kiran Mazumdar Shah from Biocon. We have Uday Kotak, uh, uh, people who have, uh, uh, who cashed in opportunities, were there at the right time, at the right place, but also uh, look at the kind of enterprises they have created, world-class enterprises. So we will be talking about all of this. Also, Amul, it's a fantastic story, a fantastic journey, and very Indian in, in, its, uh, in, in the fact that it has uh, hundreds of thousands of shareholders who are farmers across Anand and Gujarat. So phenomenal stories, these are. But you know, before we come to the 91 period in the watershed and you know, go uh, back in time to understand the landscape, Mr. Sinbi, I'm going to talk to you about a, a point that uh, Mr. Gopalakrishnan raised, that 
when he was selecting these stories for his own book series, it was difficult to come by these stories because the metric so far has been uh, stock market wealth creation, uh, you know, a, a quarter and quarter and quarter profitability growth. The moment you start looking at a wider spectrum of sustainable growth, and these are conversations that are increasingly happening across uh, uh, stock, uh, you know, experts, investors across the world, because it is being seen that just growth, uh, profitability or revenue growth is not sufficient to look at sustainability in the wrong, long term. True, I, I completely agree with you. Actually, you gave an example and a very good example is Amul. You know, to say Amul is profitable is, is a misnomer because ultimately it's a cooperative, it's a collective effort. A country which was so starved of milk in 60s and 70s when, when we, me grew up, I mean, when, when uh, Mr. Gobal Krishna grew up, we are still much younger than that, milk was just not available. It was Amul who changed the whole parameter. And then today, when we look at and compare it with many sustainable modern, I think at the end of the day is the governance, which is the key. The Amul format of the governance, which is a collective movement, where you do not have a situation of just ordinary shareholders were coming and going, but stakeholders. And Mr. Gopal Krishnan rightly mentioned that it's a question of stakeholders, not just the shareholders, which is alone. And if I drop back to my, my experience of pre-91, you talk about 91 being the one major event in the history of India. Pre-91, when I joined the cement company, the cement was to be purchased by buying a permit. You couldn't buy cement. You couldn't just go to a dealer and bought cement. You had to buy a permit, which was issued by government of India. And they used to write 25 bags or 50 bags and the purpose of buying the cement. I mean, if you bought the cement for bathroom, perhaps you couldn't use for the living room. I mean, that was the whole purpose. And this will, this will look completely, uh, it was so strange to the people today that cement was bought because it was a controlled commodity. But then came in a change in 89 and 91 and that, that changed the whole spectrum of cement industry where short mark, short, uh, shortage of cement, cement bag consists of 50 kilos, never got 50 kilos and a very poor and pathetic quality. So this is, I believe, has changed completely. It is ESG, it's environment, society and social issues safety, of course, and governance. And I think we are paying today a lot more attention than what we paid 30 years back. And that's a very important factor to be brought in mind. And it is a journey because a lot more needs to be done. Uh, Tulsi, let me get you in here. 91 is a watershed, um, a balance of payment crisis precipitated the liberalization and then rapidly, uh, you know, tariffs fell, the opening up happened. Of course, you can argue that the second generation reforms have not really happened. But from your vantage point, when you look at these companies, what do you think changed fundamentally? What was it? Not just the opening of the economy, but also the opening of minds? Absolutely. Absolutely many. So um, 1991, of course, was a watershed year. And it was a macroeconomic crisis, which brought in this entire LPG, as we know it, liberalization, privatization, and globalization. But I think more importantly, it was also a mindset change. We were looking at a local mindset of a shortage economy. Uh, Mr. Singh, we spoke about how cement was in shortage and what were the kind of licenses and so on. So it was a seller's market in, in all uh, respects. It was a seller's market and uh, there was demand. And uh, since demand was always ahead of supply, so you know the, the enterprises that were there were of a certain sort, but there was no competition absolutely. Now that changed inevitably with the kind of opening up of the economy that happened. What also happened was that things like marketing, things like product development, which had never been paid attention to because it was a seller's market, that had to change, right? That was one. The second change that happened was the way in which the political bosses looked at enterprise. Uh, it was more of a suspicious mindset. Money was a dirty word. Right, and people who made money were actually looked down upon. I think that changed inevitably after 1991, where you know, and, and uh, I'll probably touch upon it later. But uh, you also have uh, the the peak cost castization, as I would want to put it, of enterprise, because earlier enterprise was uh, was one which 
was based on certain castes and communities which would run the enterprises. Now that has also changed. So I think these are some of the fundamental changes that have happened after 1991. Of course, it was an economic crisis, but the people who are running the enterprises, especially in the knowledge economy framework, those have changed permanently. You know, looking in, Mr. Gopalakrishna, at that time you were in Lever, and I remember uh, your conversation with Harsh Mariwala from Marico, which will be uh, one of the um, episodes that we will be uh, playing out in the series. Uh, what I found interesting about it was how two peers were talking about uh, the changing face of Indian consumers. You know, uh, when you looked in, Lever was this giant and continues to be this giant, and there was this little upstart of a company uh, called Marico, which which was. Uh, a, a rehash of a family-owned business uh, because of the aggression of a young entrepreneur who wanted to make change. How did you see it? And through the eyes of a company like uh, Marico, how did you, how do you perceive the change that happened after 95? You know, if I, I'm making a very general statement now, but your question is also very general. If you look prior to 1991 or about that time, uh, it was one size fits all. Right, and variety to the consumer, easy availability to the consumer, innovative products to the consumer took second place to just getting it out of the factory. Right, so that gave you a monolithic mindset, and your whole focus was on maximizing production capacity in the factory because your capacity was limited. So, Levers was interested in pumping out. Uh, you know, uh, 1 million or 500,000 or 50,000 tons or X kilos of shampoo just so that they could fulfill. But that's how you made money by maximizing your capacity. What changed, I must add here for completeness, that the process of liberalization actually started changing when Mr. Narasimham was the finance secretary around early 80s and then the Rajiv years. Of course, in big bank, the real stuff happened in 1991, which was considered watershed. And the thinking shifted to saying, you know, variety matters, consumption matters, um, innovation matters. And 1991 resulted in imported products being available. Over a period of time, it didn't happen overnight. And my, you know, shopping list given by my wife or my family prior to 91 had, when I think back, really silly stuff. It had, uh, you know, some makeup and some lingerie and some men's undergarments and stuff that you really had no business going around in Oxford Circus buying. But then it changed dramatically. And by 2000, you were not buying all those things. If at all you bought it was some fancy malt or some fancy wine. So that's a dramatic change. And I think the great benefits that Indian consumers got, mm -hmm. and you know, it brought her back into, her meaning him or her, back into the center of the equation. And the Mariwala's Harsh Bariwalas could capitalize on that. It made presentation and packaging an important part, not just putting a clunk of soap or detergent or any motor car that ran. And if it didn't run, you hit it with a hammer, it would start running. You know, it, those days were behind you. And we are now sitting in a situation where I can't say everything is global quality here, but the idea of global quality is in people's heads. And the responses. That's why it's so tough to make money in India for a multinational company. You know, generally speaking, India is, I have worked in other countries, I've traveled a lot. I can tell you, India is one of the toughest markets in the world to make profits. In. Now, in the last 30 years, I'm not talking of before. Just imagine that. And yet you have these companies who've done phenomenally well. I'm going to talk a little bit of the stock markets, uh, Mr. Singhvi, because of, you know, I've covered a lot of that and I love <laughs> the, the markets, so to say. But um, just for the record, um, you know, uh, 1986 is when the Sensex comes up uh, uh, and uh, it took about 14 years for it to cross 1000. And today, you know where it is. 1993 was when the Infosys IPO happens. And that also was a watershed because as Mr. Gopalakrishnan said, the, the focus on technology happens, starts happening around the late 80s. Uh, a lot of Indian companies also uh, benefiting from the early uh, liberalization on the import front. Remember, that was a big issue and many companies started benefiting from that. But this focus on technology is something that happens because of Infosys listing, it comes into the open. 
that brings a new breed of entrepreneurs. You can't not talk about Infosys because it was a watershed in its own way because it was a new way of doing business. It was young, geeky technocrats who came. And by the way, we have also done a series on the making of Indian IT and you get perspectives from that. But that also fundamentally changed the way the stock markets behaved, didn't it, uh, uh, Mrs. Singhvi? The way they perceived businesses. Definitely. In fact, Kermity, that reminds me that uh, SEPI was set up in April of 1992, soon after 91. So if you look at the, the, the dates, uh, and then we had a capital of uh, controller of capital, which used to give the approval for the IPOs and which used to put an artificial clamping on this that it's a speculative. The whole mindset was that this is a den of speculators and we must control this and we must give this IPO at a very, very low pricing. So demand and supply were never looked into, even from stock market perspective. It is only post April 92, when SEBI came in, then we started the whole process of that. It is not going to the, uh, the, the babus in Delhi, but, but market forces will determine. The investment bankers will go and suggest what should be the IPO pricing. So it was actually pricing even for a commodity called shares. And then after like 93, when Infosys came in, I think a whole lot of new thinking came into the minds because Infosys was one company which changed the way people really thought about promoter-driven companies. Here were four or five guys who chucked their jobs, came together and started a company. I mean, they were called as promoters, but essentially they came together to redefine how India looked at technology. And then, then came the Y2K, which changed the entire spectrum of the company which came in and gave not only India, but globally the body shopping for technology. That you could, if you wanted to do it, you could do it in India. So I think a whole lot of things changed from 92 to 97, 98, right. both in terms of how the capital markets behave and how the companies behave. And first time we saw the governance practice coming in because Infosys set few of the standards which, which other companies had to really look up to or they, if they wanted to compete with them, measure up to. And that was, according to me, a defining movement of governance in India. Before that, the governance was just talked about. I mean, there are very few companies who really bothered about what the governance mean. And today, a huge premium is paid on account of just a good governed company and a sustainable model. So right. I think it's a, it's a very big change which has come in in the minds of people as well on this that is not, is not life as usual, which was there pre-91. But you know, it, it wasn't as though uh, liberalization in the early years was a cakewalk. There were a lot of very tough uh, turns to take, uh, mistakes that were made. And of course, it also sounded the death knell of many business houses, right? Because uh, earlier, you know, I mean, I, I remember till the late 80s, surnames uh, were very famous. They were <laughs> the comics, literally, you know, with, with, and of course, because license permit of the license permit Raj, companies just had spread unevenly across wherever there was opportunity and all of that crumbled uh, um, uh, with uh, the change in the economy. So I have two questions, uh, Tulsi, to you. The first is that, you know, the, the learning curve was very steep. When you talk about 1991, there's a tendency to romanticize it. But look at what we face. You had Enron upfront. Uh, you know, the moment you opened up, you made lots of mistakes about all the partnerships that died in the first five years. It's quite amazing to list them out. The second was the Asian crisis, you know, which was a period where I think was a transformation in itself because Indian companies tightened their seat belts and became low-cost manufacturers. And it, they really came out of that crisis really well. So what were the initial periods like and what was the devastation that happened across family-owned businesses? So um, in terms of uh, the family managed businesses, I think uh, uh, this whole period has been a period where the governance in particular was, was a challenge. Hmm. And uh, when you're looking at things like profits, if I look at uh, something like a Kotak Mahindra Bank, for instance, a Kotak Mahindra Bank came out of the Asian crisis far better because uh, what he did was, what uh, Uday Kotak did was that he decided that they would actually sell off and, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, to, to shed some of their portfolios, right? So in terms of the agility, while you would see people like Kotak who came from a family business background, uh, extremely agile and nimble, the ones which did not have that agility did not survive that crisis. So I think the governance, the 
focus on the short term and the long term. And the fact that these are companies which could uh, have critical thinking, that is what really distinguished the survivors from the ones which perished, the crisis. So, so that is what I would say. Right. Can, I, can, I, can I add a comment to what uh, Susi said? I'm putting it in a different way. Um, you know, prior to 91, uh, it was GQ, genetic quotient, that determined success in Indian business. Me, my son, my grandson. Uh, the advent of professional managers, which had, of course, started long before 91, brought in IQ, bright people who went to IIT, IIM. Then the Daniel Goldman jazz started and EQ came into the uh, dictionary and people, you know, the HR people. But what liberalization did was bring AQ, which is adaptability quotient. I think Indian industry never had to adapt except to government policies. <laughs> and so if you went to Delhi five times a year, uh, a month, which I used to do, by the way, uh, and there was one meeting in particular since an anecdote always helps. We, there was only Indian Airlines. I got up at 4 o'clock in the morning to catch a flight at 6.30 or 7, like many others did. Went to Delhi to a particular ministry and I was bounced from director to joint secretary to additional secretary until we met the secretary. This was price control and he was trying to determine the price at which we could sell a tin of uh, Vanaspati. And he arbitrarily said, I am told you should sell it at 90. I think it should be 85. Yeah. And one person got up and said, I've spent my company's money, my shareholders' money. This is before 91. Huh? I've spent my shareholders' money. I've given up my sleep not to come here and be given an arbitrary thing by you. If you want to do that, do what you want. And he walked out of the room. And what a dramatic effect, but it's very close to 1991. So this adaptability quotient became very, very important. And I think I'm saying what Tulsi said in a different way. GQ changed with IQ, which then brought EQ and Indian adapt, uh, industry has now become far more adaptive. You know, Singhvi, it's amazing that even in, in the context of business, there are two Indias, right? There is one India that continues to be, you know, forward-looking, international, expansion, uh, innovation. All of these are buzzwords within it. There is another India which is still accused of crony capitalism. The NPA crisis only iterates all of that. And that has also determined the perception of Indian business. Because the moment you talk about perception of Indian business, the two things are, oh, uh, you know, it's corrupt. And B, that, uh, you, know, it, you know, it's very shady, you know, for a lay viewer. And that's really sad because that's not really true because... Enterprise is important, profitability is important, and growth is important because that creates jobs and a better quality of life. Where does the problem lie, according to you? Well, uh, in fact, I'll take uh, this to your uh, previous uh, question where you had put that what happened, why from 91 to 2021, 30 years, what change has brought in? I think the change, according to me, is twofold. One is that whole license raj, whole command economy situation to a liberal, to a market oriented economy. So that's how you have people like, I mean, I can name it here, like Modi's or, or DCM, the Sri Rams uh, or Singhania's or Thapur's are not there because they were the one, as I often used to hear in Delhi, that whosoever landed in, at Palam airport for, for any foreign collaboration, they would hijack the person from the Palam airport itself and get a license and start a business because that was the easiest thing to do. Now it's no more. Now you have to look at the demand supply, look at what customer wants rather than hijacking somebody from the Palam airport and start your shop. So today, when you look at the business, the sustainable model, and, and India is becoming far too competitive field. So anyone who's making money in India is, is, is really doing everything right. And that's very, and I can, I can talk about in cement. It is such an important uh, uh, commodity and it's an important play. But to make money in cement is, is a virtually impossible because the kind of uh, cost which you have, the structures which you have is still... 28% GST. So have we come from 91 to 2021 into a more uh, consumer-centric, more in terms of uh, uh, what, what a consumer should pay for a product? No, still long way to go. So to answer your question that, how is it that what, what wealth creation has really come by or, or been created by the companies is sustainable model, is the model of SDFC, is the model of Uday Kotak, doing right thing at the right time, and keeping the governance and structure in place. I don't think there's any other model which can really work. 
Right. What are the commonalities, Mr. Gopalakrishnan? Because the people that we have uh, identified as the shapers of enterprise come from different areas, different businesses. There's little in common between a Kiran Mazumdar show and biotech uh, and uh, Maruti, which makes cars. But what, according to you, are the salient principles that bind them as companies and shapers of enterprise? You know, in the research that uh, SP Jain faculty, of which uh, Tulsi was a very valued member, uh, we found that there is a three plus five matrix. Uh, this is the Indian formula because there are good to great and uh, lessons from excellent companies that are very American based. And nobody had done a research on Indian companies. I would like to believe that, uh, I hope I'm not wrong in this statement, SPGN is the first institution to undertake any form of research. And like all research, the first research can be improved and somebody else builds. Um, what does the three plus five mean? That three attributes, we call them mindset, behavior, and action, were essential. And five were optional. You chose which one suited you because there are many ways to skin the cat. The three essential ones were a very high people orientation. And by people, I don't mean just employees. I mean vendors, distributors, stakeholders, etc. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into all this and it's all been published and in the public domain, but people orientation was the number one. And this is very different from American companies. In none of the books of excellence will you find people oriented. It will feature, but not as a number one feature. In India, everything works through relationship, yaar karade, not through process. So that was the first. The second one is the ability to handle long-term and short-term simultaneously. And that was a very important feature here because you have to put out the bushfires now to be able to survive. And the number of bushfires in India would not vanish due to 1991. So that was the uh, second feature that I, I would like to mention. And the third one was uh, uh, a stakeholder orientation. I think it was a very uh, important thing, A, because it was the first one, B, it pointed out differences compared to US companies. And it shows us our natural Indian genius on which we should build for the future. Tulsi, would you like to add on this from an academic standpoint? Also, what to you makes these companies stand out? So many, uh, I would completely agree with Mr. Gopalakrishnan and going back to the family businesses question also. I think uh, nurturing of talent was something which one has not really understood uh, prior to 1991. You know, so you would have a bunch of people who would be working for enterprises. And if you look at enterprise, uh, we are looking at the enterprises which were run by, say, the Gujaratis or the Marwadis or the, or the Chetiars as a community, where people would be taken more on the basis of loyalty than on the basis of merit, right? Now, how do you actually attract talent? How do you nurture talent? How do you retain talent? Now, this, this was absolutely phenomenal. I mean, I could just... Uh, talk to you about uh, uh, Mr. Kotak. And if you look at 1985, this young man who was just about 25, drawing some of the biggies from, you know, some of the best banks around, some of the best financial institutions around, they give up their well-paid jobs and they come in and uh, they join uh, Kotak. I mean, one would wonder what is it that made these people A, join and B, uh, be there for 20, 25 years or even more, right? So when you're looking at institutions, the fact that you need to have people as the basis for that institution is extremely critical, right? And then also not this short-term, see, uh, in family businesses, we talk about something as patient capital, which is very important. You have financial capital, you have physical capital, you have financial capital, you have social capital, but you also have something called patient capital. And that is the short-term versus the long-term. Now that again for an institution becomes extremely critical. Are you able to look at the short-term profits profitability, but also at the long-term survival, okay? And that uh, to come to Mr. Singhvi's question is also about um, adopting good governance practices. Now, these are things which probably were not there in the enterprises prior to 1991, because you didn't need to do anything to survive. All you needed was to get a license. Right, and all you needed to do was to make sure that you were, you, you know, kind of making certain that you remained within whatever the norms were, 
And what comes to my mind here is uh, uh, an anecdote about Rahul Bajaj when he had to face the MRTP commission because he had produced more scooters than what he was supposed to produce. And the, the, the court asks him, why should we not uh, prosecute you for producing more? And he says, my grandfather, he worked, uh, he fought for freedom and I'm going to fight for my right to produce for the motherland. You know, so, so what we're talking about uh, as institutions are basically uh, enterprises, which give a lot of importance to these. And I think our, uh, the institutions that we studied are basically institutions because of these characteristics. Mr. Singhvi, I want to ask you this question. You know, for a lot of the youngsters, this generation, post-liberalization generation, working in MNCs, uh, new companies, et cetera, tech companies, this is a different world. This is a di different era. But it exists even today because if you look at Indian business, it's overwhelmingly business, uh, family owned. It's overwhelmingly old world. You know, the, the portion of, of, of entre enterprises that we are looking at is a narrow sliver if you compare it to the larger piece. And that is one of the reasons that India is also a largely a small company uh, you know, uh, economy. But from your vantage point, what do you see? How do you see the change happening? Because, you know, uh, Tulsi is absolutely right. I mean, the biggest challenge today is attracting the right talent, the right capital. It's a fight for everything. And investors and employees are looking at much more than just a company or a, a, a job to work in. Oh, really, you raised a very valid point. And I think to take on and build on Tulsi's point on that, I often have said this, that there were many cases or perhaps there were very few exceptions where the bedroom and the boardroom did not differentiate. Okay, so you have family and businesses where whole of the bedroom was there in the boardroom as well. I mean, so the board meeting was conducted largely as a bedroom meeting. They call all the family members and decide and there were mute spectators called independent directors and, and all decisions were taken which could have been very well taken in the bedroom as well. But I think things have changed. I think they've realized that you can't bring your all your pets in the boardroom. Uh, there, there's some pets have to be left at home. And coming back to the point of talent, the talent came also into the boardroom. So you invited few board members who could perhaps question your judgment, perhaps even have some constructive criticism, which wasn't the case. If you look at 20 years back, and even in the boardroom, I mean, I often say that people in the boardroom open their mouth only to pop a cashew nut, not to make a point. So I think that the, the, the whole purpose of the board meeting is, is today far more different, far more uh, uh, supposedly having a debates, discussions and all that. And that's where the confidence of the investor who's putting in money is coming in. Earlier it was there that if you like to buy my share, buy my share. If you don't like it, please don't buy it. I mean, that's, that's the end of it. But today you're aggressively going and wooing the investors to put capital into your company because you've put all the standards, all the corporate governance in practice. And, and, and very few boards today would really mirror image the bedrooms. And which is, according to me, a transformation change, which has come in the last 10, 15 years, because you're getting the institutional capital. You're not getting the retail guy who just subscribed into an IPO. And if IPO is making money, he's happy about it. And he doesn't care about the company at all. Now is the case where people like Invesco taking on to some of the very large conglomerates here, because they feel that they have invested a huge capital as compared to what capital has been brought in by the family. And they need to look at and they need to really set right few things which they believe, uh, whether they're right or wrong. But I'm saying at least the, the, the so-called capitalism is working. I, I don't call it activism, actually. I, there's a point of capitalism. We want the capital, but we don't want the voice behind the capital. That can't work. That simply can't work. If there is a capital, there will be a voice, whether it's a debt capital by the banks or equity capital by the investors. Can I add a little point to what Anil, Anil, Anil uh, uh, used some words which for a lay audience, people will wonder what is Invesco and what is Z and so on. But can I just anecdote, uh, anecdotize it a, a bit? Three features I want to point out, which common people will recognize. First, uh, if you leave out a few exceptions, promoters don't call it my company anymore. They say our company this bedroom and uh, I would have preferred the word drawing room, but <laughs> you use the word to say the private domain and the public domain. So it's our company. Their behavior may not quite match up to that, but many people have adjusted to that. That's the first point. 
The second is you look at newspaper headlines. Just for fun, take a newspaper of the 70s or the 80s. It will say XYZ announces 100 crore investment in so and so place. It was investment because it was a license and project driven. Today, you'll find it difficult to get news uh, out of an investment per se. It will happen by saying uh, new, uh, uh, new service is going to be available, uh, huge investment is going to happen in infrastructure by the government, you know, things that promote. So consumerism has, that's reflecting of that. And the third and the last point I want to, why am I so sanguine and optimistic that we are on the right track, despite the few aberrations? These six companies that we studied in the SPJMR study, we call it the shapers of business institution study, just six companies, huh? uh, on a particular date when I computed this one year ago, accounted for 30% of the Bombay Stock Exchange market value. They didn't exist 30 years ago. They were zero. So, you know, like the Eid Ka Chan doesn't happen suddenly. They slowly, there is a change over 28 days. We will also see a change that more and more companies will become these institutional looking companies. There will be the odd aberration that happens. And that's good for the consumer. It's good for the shareholder. It's good for the community. So, Balakrishnan, as, as we've said in uh, multiple times of the series, India will need at least, uh, India at 100 will need multiple such companies to actually uh, achieve its own targets. Uh, what are the lessons from these companies that that you have covered, that we will be covering in the Shapers of Enterprise, that you think will be important for any company wanting to walk this path? The first is, and we have discussed that a lot, so I'm not going to repeat it, this point about people orientation and talent. So since it's been mentioned a number of times, I want to, I want to mention two others. One I made a passing reference and one I didn't mention. In our study, we found that it's something which we have called critical thinking. Now, educationists may have a certain definition. The way we have thought of critical thinking is can business people think beyond the non-obvious solutions? And the metaphor in my mind, this is my metaphor, if you put a geologist and an astronomer on the surface of the moon and they were asked to pull out their own kits and do their work, what will the geologist do? He'll dig into the ground and report back that, that he has found water or zinc or whatever. The astronomer will look up to the sky and say, wow, this is a part of something else which is the sky looks very different. We need businessmen who are geologists and astronomers. So far, we have had people who are geologists who can jump in, they know how to do it, but we now need astronomers. And what we are seeing in the shapers is that and you, you, you sat in on some interviews. There are people who are able to be geologists one moment, astronomer next moment. And that combination is what gives the fulfillment. The last uh, skill that I will refer to is I refer to short and long term. Mm -hmm. And while we have not written about this in the book, I, metaphors help because we are talking to a general audience and not an MBA audience. You know, the best metaphor for people who handle short term and long term without any training is the mother. I now see my daughters having their babies and they are fantastic because mothers have to deal with a crying baby, the short term, without ever stopping to dream whether my daughter or son will become an engineer or an accountant or a lawyer. And mothers do that instinctively. And I'm surrounded in a house with uh, one wife, two daughters and three grandchildren, three granddaughters. So I can see this happening all the time. Indian businessmen will have to, that, that attitude of some of our younger people, that there is so much work to do that I have no time to think of the long term, has to be exterminated from their mind. It is a human uniqueness that we can deal with the short and the long term. Otherwise, the human species would not have come this far. Right. If our mothers, grandmothers and great-grandmothers didn't lead, deal with the short and the long term simultaneously, and Indian managers are very... Uh, likely to be able to convert this advantage into an international competitive advantage. And to be fair, fair and gender neutral, even fathers and grandfathers can do that. <laughs> Tulsi, uh, you know, what are the challenges that family-owned businesses, uh, and I, I was looking at uh, 
Dr. Arvind Panagriya's uh, book on India Unlimited. And what was amazing was the fact that the large bulk of Indian companies are family owned. Yes. And they're also very, very small. They are maximum, you know, employing five people or more. I mean, that is the problem. And you cannot achieve the success that we are talking about without actually getting scale and, uh, you know, shedding the yoke of family and, and getting uh, good quality people in. So what are the challenges and what are the answers for, for these companies? So, you know, many um, on a slightly different note, uh, most family businesses aspire for growth, aspire for scaling up. But I'll just tell you research which shows that uh, size and longevity are inversely related. You know, uh, some of the oldest companies in the world, which are Japanese companies, 1400 years old and more, are companies which have been very, very small, right? Now that aside, Yes, most family businesses remain small. That has also been because of the kind of tax structure and the kind of incentives that have been given, uh, you know, as part of the political process for SMEs to continue to remain small. Um, is that changing? The answer is yes. Okay. Uh, companies do want to grow, do want to scale up. However, even if they become large corporates, okay, and uh, probably Mr. Singhvi might bear me out on this one. Um, if the mindset remains that of a small family business owned Banya corporation, that is going to be the biggest challenge for scaling up and for growth. Because coming back to that point that we have been, I think, harping upon, you would not be able to uh, nurture talent. And I'll just give you an anecdote here. Uh, we were having a, a, a certain fireside chat with some of the uh, family business companies which have hired professionals. And this guy who runs a fairly uh, medium-sized business, he tells me that I hired somebody from an MNC and within six months, the guy went off back to an MNC despite the fact that they were paying lesser. And he says, I'm never going to take these MNC guys into my company because uh, you know I don't know what to do with them. The whole point is, what do you do to nurture those guys? Um, and I would say this, I would say this to my family business uh, uh, students also, that, you know, the day your husband who works in Accenture leaves Accenture and comes and joins your company, that's when you think you've become, you know, a company which is worth remaining. So the challenges to family businesses are the mindset, which even if they grow larger, continue to be small. Um, the way in which they're looking at retaining and hiring talent the way they are looking at governance, not just corporate governance, but also family governance. Like Mr. Singhvi said, the, the bedroom or the drawing room comes to the boardroom and then all of them remain shut because it's the founder who speaks or the elder person who speaks. It's about systems and processes, right? So all of these are going to be the challenges. And how do you overcome these? I think um, if there is sufficient narrative around you know, and, and let's not get away from the fact that more than 80% in India, 75% in India, and 90% in the world, the Walmarts and the Samsungs and the Reliances are all family managed, family owned businesses. So uh, unless and until they are able to see in them their role models, you would not see that kind of change. Right. I did a uh, series with Howard. Mini, Mini, I just want to add just a few numbers. Uh, to give a color to the point that you are making and which you're debating rightly. India has 66 million enterprises. 66 million. Of which only 19,000 have a capital of more than 10 crores. So we are land of fruit flies. The enterprise world is a land of fruit flies, which you notice only when they come and sit on your fruit. Otherwise, you don't notice them. Of the 19,000 enterprises which have a capital of more than 10 crores, only 5,000 are listed. Of the 5,000 that are listed, 100 contribute to all of the market cap. So you can see that what we call enterprise is uh, got, got a long way to reform and go. But luckily, we are on the right journey. And that's the value of the series Shapers of Enterprise in India. It's amidst this confusion this chaos and this uncertainty that we value companies that have uh, grown the right way, uh, they have 
done the right things and they represent perhaps the best of Indian companies, the best of Indian enterprise and entrepreneurship, which needs to be replicated, which needs to first be studied, analyzed. We should get insights from these entrepreneurs and see how this can be replicated. And Mr. Gopal Krishnan Tulsi and Mr. Singhvi, thank you so much for joining us. We will have all of their perspectives as we make our way through these companies, meet the entrepreneurs, spend time with them to understand their journey and understand what really got them here. And what, what should we do to really get um, a dozen, uh, maybe 200 companies <laughs> on this path in the next 10 to 15 years? Many thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. I just want to close on the note of what you just said, that I hope this series that you have done and the research work done earlier in SP Jain will be seen as the ikigai of corporate health. <laughs> And if I may just add many, I mean, I don't, I don't want to take away the last word from you and Mr. Gopalakrishnan, but, you know, uh, based on whatever all of you were speaking about, these are institutions, these are enterprises which showed that valuations are on the basis of value and values. Very not good on point. the basis of from some fraud, you know, so value, it's values which builds value, which then <laughs> should build valuation ideally. Great point, great point. That's a great point. And I think I'll let you have the last word of this, Tulsi. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you.